Hello and welcome to Unstress Health. My name is Dr. Ron Early. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, today we explore the world of technology and its impact on our health physical, mental. I'm very pleased to welcome back Jocelyn Brewer. Jocelyn has been on the podcast before, but uh, after the last uh, year or two of our immersion in the digital world, it seemed only appropriate uh, to get uh, Jocelyn back. Uh, And as like with many of our guests, I think it's important to uh, reconsider the issues that we raise in the podcast and I don't know about you, but the impact the digital technology has on our lives, our relationships, uh, is perhaps one of the biggest challenges we face. Now, we've done programs on EMF radiation from Wi-Fi, which I have to remind you is in 2011, was classified by the World Health Organization as a class 2B carcinogen a possible carcinogen. Sobering to know that. Uh, But we're not talking about that aspect of it. That comes under the environmental stress uh, part of our holistic health model. No, this is about how we engage and how our children engage with our technology and with technology and how families engage. So Jocelyn's a registered psychologist. She's uh, she runs a boutique private practice in the inner west of Sydney. She's worked individually with adults and adolescents as well as with families and parents across a wide range of mental health and life challenges. She works extensively with schools as well. Uh, She's got training in cognitive behavioural therapy, acceptance and commitment, uh, as well as other tools in her toolbox. We cover the whole issue of getting this balance right and some of the challenges that we're all experiencing. Look, it's a wonderful conversation. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Jocelyn Brewer. Welcome back, Jocelyn. Thank you so much for having me. It's always very exciting to chat to you rather than being a listener, which I usually oh, well, am. Oh, that's so good to hear. But listen, Jocelyn, your whole thing, you're a psychologist. Tell us a little bit of, give us some background. Sure. Look, people could go back and listen to the episode we did about mm-hmm. 18 months, two years, but so much has happened since yes. then in the digital world. Yeah. Give us Jocelyn Brewer 101. What's, sure. Tell us about Jocelyn. Tweet length version. Um, I... <laughs> no, 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 no. You can do more than that. <laughs> um, look, I was a high school teacher. I trained 20 years ago to be a high school teacher. And then after about six years in the classroom, I became a school counsellor. And at that point, really got into looking at young people and their video game habits. I was like a dog with a bone, really was fascinated with then how much technology was showing up in our lives and started studying what we now call cyber psychology. So I actually last week finally submitted the corrections for my Masters of Applied Science in cyber psychology. Yeah, and that's and I, I do bits of research and commentary and really examine how our human um how are humans and our behavior, how we live, how we love, how we learn, being impacted by um you know, the saturation of technology and screens in our life and the information that comes with that as well is really fascinating. Well, it's such a huge part of our lives lives, and it's become even more so in the last two years. But I'm fascinated about your master's and to t- mm. just tell me some of the, <laughs> what are some of the pearls you've picked up in yeah. this? Because it, it really focuses you, mm-hmm. doesn't it, doing something like that? Yeah, so I looked at a group of year seven kids. So um, it ended up being about 150 of them. Year seven is a really important transition point because you go mm. out of a primary school where you have that one teacher into a much bigger pond. And often that's the point that young people get their first smartphone. Mum and dad say, okay, you're going off to big school or high school here's this incredibly powerful device. And what I was interested in was whether or not the young people who had self-reported higher levels of self-control had less chance of developing problems with using their smartphone. Now, hypothesis was, yes, more self-control, 
better use. And that's what we found that actually, you know, I, I guess the, the learning here is if we teach young people really clearly how to have self-control, then they're more likely to then overcome some of the difficulties that they have with using such a high powered tempting device where their entire peer group is really at the end of it, right? It's not like the old rotary phone where there was really only one person on the end of it. The entire world is potentially there. Um, and self-control, I think, is really interesting because we don't sometimes stop and, and nut it out to go, self-control actually means you have to apply it yourself. It's not your mum applying it or your dad applying it. And it means that you give up doing something now for something in the future that's more valuable to you. So if as a young person you don't have a sense of yourself in the future, you don't have goals, you can't see yourself being insert what you want to be when you grow up, it's really hard then to assert self-control because what? why would you give up this game of Fortnite in order to become something else when you don't know what that is. So there's a lot in it just from a pure psychology perspective of, of getting young people to have um, that positive psychology sort of model of meaning and purpose and engagement in their lives. Hmm. I mean, just uh, looking at any group of people, mm -hmm. let alone young people, um, we are all, or a lot of people are, totally glued to their devices and kids would just be, I mean, it's so addictive, isn't it? I mean, I think we we spoke to you and about and and near Al, yeah. who you yeah, introduced yeah. us to, and and we talked about dopamine mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a you know addictive thing. Yeah. But we don't let people have cigarettes. We don't let them have alcohol too young. But this is so addictive. It, it is because what we're addicted to really is to one another, right? It's it, when when you think about um, what do most of us do with technology. There's usually mm -hmm. a human on the other side. We're playing games with one another. We're scrolling social media because we're having, I guess, sometimes parasocial relationships with celebrities or pe people like you, Ron, you know, like I follow you and I have a sense of your life and what you're doing because I actually have this kind of parasocial relationship because I, you know, view your podcast and things like that. So that's connection. And I guess where digital nutrition comes in is to really start appraising the value and the virtual vitamins within those activities because these last two years would have been much more difficult without having the technology that we did. When you think of the first SARS epidemic that happened, you know, really in a much um, more endemic area of um, China where you've got often one child and then that burst of in 2003-ish or whenever it was, um, that burst of uh, technology around games, we actually did see the start of some of the, the kind of gaming addiction kind of hotspots and pockets. Um, and thankfully now our computers are much more connected and so we were able to use them in ways to get that connection with one another in lieu of, you know, the face-to-face. -face. Mm. But I, I love that. I love the fact that we're addicted to one another because I think we've learned some important lessons mm. about connection during this pandemic. But you mentioned uh, digital nutrition mm -hmm. and just remind us about digital nutrition sure. because I think we all need reminders. Yeah, it's basically a positive tech use philosophy that uses the analogy with food rather than drugs to consider our relationship with technology. So um, I don't believe that we can live lives where we are technology free or di digital device free these days. I think that is it too much of an ask and to go cold turkey is often, you know, too too difficult um, so what we do is we think about the virtual vitamins. We think about the content of what we're consuming, whether or not we can trust the source of that. Um, we, we think about the context of what's happening. So the middle of a rainy lockdown in 2021 is very, very different than to, you know, the 2020. Two twenty-three 23 school holidays summer where hopefully La Nina holds off just for a little bit longer so that we can get out and really kind of reconnect in that face-to-face -face and be present to one another. So context is really everything here. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned trust as well, and that's a, that's a huge issue, navigating that in today's world, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, increasingly, my work in the last maybe six months or so has really pivoted into this um, kind of infobesity situation that we have where we have so much information to kind of wade through. And often what happens is there's a lot of emotion that sits with some of this kind of information that's out there. A really interesting kind of example here is the prevalence of ADHD diagnoses in women, especially in adult women, mm. and how that has really um, 
kind of piqued people's interest through TikTok and TikTokers who were sharing all of this information about ADHD. It's really sparked an incredible kind of, um, it's a bit of a social trend. I wouldn't say that it's, you know, just trendy Mm. Um, because we know that something like ADHD has probably been well masked in, in women and, and our kind of stereotype of what a a kid with ADHD looks like is very, very, you know, um, narrow. But when we examine things like, and somebody's already done research on this, the top 100 viewed videos on TikTok that are hashtagged Mm. ADHD, of those, a massive proportion actually have misinformation in them. And when they look at who makes them, whether it's a healthcare professional or a non-healthcare professional, otherwise known just as an influencer with no qualifications, we see those people who don't have the qualifications are actually sharing more misinformation than obviously those of us who do have qualifications and are grounded in a bit more science and rigour. So when um, we're talking about young people, that's the kind of app du jour, I guess, um, TikTok for um, many, many people, billions of people worldwide, we really need to put on that kind of media literacy hat to say, does this sound too good to be true? Because it probably is. And what's the source of this, this information? Is this actually kind of verified information that I can trust? Mm. It's so interesting to hear you say that because, um, you know, we're about to launch. I didn't intend to do a commercial here, but we're yes. inten- we're, co- we're launching next in, in the thir- four, fourth quarter of this year, 2022, mm-hmm unstress health, which is, I've been inspired by a lot of my patients who are uh, running wellness platforms mm-hmm. with with some limited uh, health background. Uh, and I don't judge, I just mm-hmm. am inspired by them. But so we've decided to build our own, but the, the byline really is uh, uh, back, built on clinical experience and backed by mm. science. And uh, I think that does still count for quite a bit. Absolutely. And that's not to discount that lots of people are really smart and can navigate yep, their way absolutely. through that. That's what I but mean. I, I don't judge. Yeah. I guess when you have something like APRA, the, the health regulator in Australia, where you do have to kind of meet certain pers- uh, professional development goals and all of those things, um, it is quite different, say, to, you know, the coaching movement where, again, there's still lots of accreditations and, yep. and pathways within that. Um, and, and I myself run a program for influencers called the Intentional Influencer. So that intentional, um, so that, um, you know, influencers can actually have that opportunity to check in with the information that they're um, sharing so that they're sharing from really great principles. Mm. Well, we're definitely going to have to talk after this uh, interview. Yeah. Uh, but you back to the year sevens, because that is, that is a very vulnerable age. I mean, high school is a very vulnerable age. And the, the whole last two years have added to that vulnerability. What what have you seen in in schools? And you know, what's your impression of what impact these last two years have had on on mental health? Yeah, it's a huge question, right? Because mm. the the nature of individual differences is that for some of my clients, they've loved not having to travel an hour each way into school. They were able to kind of get more sleep roll out of bed, do their learning, you know, really take back that 10 hours a week for some of them. Um, And for others who are, I guess, a little bit more social and um, the ones who are a bit, you know, more sporty, we're really missing some of that face-to-face, you know, get together, kick the ball physically around. And I think really what, what we need to look at is not young people in isolation from their parents, but the impact that everything had on their parents and how that then trickled down. So what I deal with too is a lot of adults who are still really trying to bounce forward from the last couple of years and from having really sometimes three full-time jobs of, you know, remote learning their their, um, own role as well as them parenting and running a household and keeping family connected and things like that. So, um, you know, that then I think what we're seeing is the impact on parenting and that parents can actually hold space to put some boundaries in place for young people around technology, that um, I'm running more and more courses for um, parents to help them put those boundaries back into place and reset the boundaries around, okay, you know, lockdowns are over. We now need to really get the sand pit around the digital devices because they pop up in every crevice possible unless we're very clear about, you know, the content and the context of what we're using, when we're using it, why we're using it. 
Mm. And that is an issue cross-generational. I mean, it's not unique to young kids, teenagers. It's, I see it, I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. So if you were advising me to somehow get control back of my life from uh, the technology that I have literally at my side, what, what are some of the things you, you would tell me? Well, we'll go back to the three ends of digital nutrition, I think, here, Ron, because to be mindful, to be really present to what is it that you're looking for. So, you know, even to go back to dopamine, what is it that we're seeking there? We're seeking that little kind of burst, that little bit of information, that little bit of connection, that little feel-good hit. So really thinking, where else can I get this? What am I seeking? You know, we're we're still hunters and gatherers ultimately, but we're hunting and gathering information. So we can be then um, work out whether or not there's meaning associated with it. So is this aligned to my goals? Is this a meaningful thing for me? Do I need to, you know, read another article about some celebrity influencer and who they're I don't know, having an affair with this week or what domestic violence charges certain people are up on and all of that kind of celebrity gossip? Or do I really want to get more tips and hints on how to focus, how to concentrate, how to, I don't know, whatever you're into, whatever the pain point is for you. And then the third one is, um, so we've got mindful, moderate, um, mindful, (laughs) forget them all the time, mindful, meaningful, and then moderate. So how can we moderate our use? Because we still only have 24 hours in a day. If you're using technology for a big chunk of that, um, what are you displacing? What are you missing out on? Hmm. I guess so we hear the expression fear of missing out, mm, FOMO. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's all about, cl- and so much of what we interact with is about clickability, how clickable. And mm-hmm. it's, it's almost, well, it's so exquisitely designed, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's another beautiful media literacy example there because clickbait is literally designed to pique your interest. You have to say something sensational to get someone to want to read the article. So if it's just kind of a good news story where like nothing much happened, that's not actually driving the clicks, which is then driving the advertising revenue. So I think we need to understand that most technology that we or platforms that we engage in, whether it's social media, whether it's you know, the big search engines, even whether it's, you know, the information and media outlets, they're all driven by advertising revenue, the ability to get ads into your eyeballs and influence you to hit click and buy. So, you know, really stepping back from that and looking at some of those ways that that those things are literally engineered um, so that we can ask better better questions around what deserves my time and what deserves me to pay attention to it. So I talk to young people all the time, like you're paying with your attention. You're not paying necessarily with dollars. Um, You're paying with that very, very important resource that you have called your attention. Hmm. But it's it's cheap, isn't it? I mean, in the sense that you don't have to do much. You're a very pa- you can be very passive. I mean, yes, you have to work your thumbs, mm-hmm. um, but but in terms of get up and move and do things, it's it's so easy. It is so easy, and even with things built into platforms like Instagram or TikTok, where it will say, "Hey, do you want to have a break?" So my Instagram is set up. If I've been scrolling for ten minutes. It will ask me whether or not I want to have a break. Super easy for me to say, no, thank you. I'm really enjoying just kicking back and running with my thumbs. Um, so until we get stronger, again, that's that's self-control. That's me saying, well, what do I need to do instead versus, you know, fulfilling this need and, and, and gratifying this desire right now? Um, and that's where having that vision and being connected to, well, I really want to get this master's done or I really want to get this other big, more important piece of work done. Um, it, it's, it's a really hard thing to do. Here I am in almost middle age and I'm still like, hmm, yes, I will keep scrolling. Let alone young people with, you know, brain architecture that isn't fully wired where they've grown up, you know, plugged into this sort of technology. So it's interesting that you should say you get an alert up after 10 minutes of looking at Instagram. Yeah. I think that's an indication of how little time I do spend on Instagram because I've never had that alert. But what are some, I mean, what are some of the things that you do, Jocelyn Brewer, knowing everything you know, uh, <laughs> to, to limit your, you know, your digital, mm-hmm. what's, what do you, how do you build that into your life? Yes. 
Um, I have only Instagram on my phone. That said, I do now have Be Real, the Be Real app where three random times a day it will prompt you to take a photo with your front and back camera to sort of be real. You just like take a snap of what you're doing in that moment. Um, I've been on that just to experiment with it, but only my like two or three closest friends are there. So we kind of get this really nice little snapshot into each other's lives. Um, but generally I don't have social media on my phone. Occasionally at a conference I'll chuck Twitter on there and then I'll, I'll get rid of it. But even with social media on my desktop, I log out. I log out each day and then I'll have a couple of days off depending on what's in the media, depending on how I'm needing to connect with other people. You might find that I have a flurry on Twitter and then I go away from that and then I don't look at Facebook very often. So I really kind of tune in to like where does my time need to be and what am I looking for? So I apply those three M's quite a bit. I'm constantly kind of, um, I guess, curating who, who I follow. And I follow and unfollow people quite often because sometimes their, their content just goes off or I'm not as interested. And then I am, I'm a real fan of sleep. So that really helps. I'm not one of those people who is like, you know, FOMO from staying up. I'm like, put, mm-hmm. put me to bed. Now I'm yes. not fantastic with like not looking at my phone for an hour before bed, but because there's not a lot on my phone, um, the most is just like checking in with some messages. I have to be quite careful about checking my email before bed because I get clients and all sorts of people emailing me at all times and that can really activate me. So if somebody says, Mm. I want to cancel my appointment or I'm having this or I'm having that, I go into work mode. So I'm pretty good at not looking at my messages, like my email first thing and last thing because I've just been burnt too many times of that feeling of like, (gasps) and now I'm awake. So often the, the stuff around sleep has to do with the sensory kind of, stickiness of what we're consuming as opposed to a lot of people would say it's the blue light it can be the blue light that then works against that melatonin window and the the kind of you know all of those sorts of things happening in your brain the lullaby effect um Mm -hmm. that we're really looking for uh so but you know like if you're if you're playing a really violent game or you're looking at sometimes it can just be like you know somebody shared some awful news or whatever that really activates your brain and then you're awake and alert rather than getting into that lullaby drift off state so Mm. um i don't do a huge amount i guess i I do use i'm at my laptop quite a bit doing telehealth um writing newsletters prepping presentations but most of it is yeah work aligned and, and that's, mm. that's how I guess most people, you know, we're all on screens as adults, mostly because of work, not because we're playing Candy Crush or, you know, mm. having yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm pleased to hear your sleep is such a priority. And, mm. I, and you know, kind of dubbed, what you're saying there is uh, often what we've said, and that is it's not a time to connect with the world. It's time to connect with your pillow. Yes. And uh, <laughs> once you get your neo, the, the frontal cortex, once you mm. get your brain activated at that time of day your bedtime is doomed yes yes so, and so. and you know the one o'clock going to sleep thing is just not sustainable and what I do see with young people is that their sleep is absolutely out of whack because they find it really hard to get off devices and and have pacts with one another where they say okay it's nine thirty. we all agree we're not we're going to get out of the group chat we all agree that you can't ostracize somebody for not being in the group chat until 1 a.m. Um, mm. So having those compacts within groups of young people and even within groups of um, of parents, for parents to be able to say to another kid's parent, hey, can we agree on this, is really, really helpful. It kind of re- help, uh, helps reform the village and, and reset the village so you don't feel like you're the only parent actually doing some of that work. Um, Mm. And we just forget how important sleep is as a foundation for practically everything else. I always say it influences mood, metabolism and memory. You know, really broadly speaking, you're grumpy and a a kid who's grumpy and a kid who's depressed is sometimes, you know, a, a very similar presentation. So it's mood, metabolism and memory. So a kid who's quite sleep deprived and tired sometimes can present very similarly so um i guess with sleep what i say is that it impacts mood metabolism and memory mood how grumpy you are sometimes it looks a lot like a depressed you know depression and and tiredness can can present similarly metabolism how your body uses energy so it can impact mood metabolism and memory so mood how 
you show up as a bit grumpy, metabolism, the way your body processes energy. So things like insulin resistance and some of the, the hormonal kind of changes, especially in young people that are already going off. And then memory, how you code your learning and remember stuff. Um, we've just got huge cognitive loads for so much information coming into our brain. And then trying to process that if we're not sleeping for long enough, we're actually not doing the, the mental tidy up that our brain needs to do and that, that cleanse through those different phases of sleep that we need to be able to function and remember the, the stuff that matters, which is really the curriculum. Mm. I think looking at my own daughters who have three children and two children, I, I often reflect that the biggest challenge for parents today is how to navigate um, technology on so many different levels, because it's a whole family issue, isn't it? Absolutely. And the modelling of parents really impacts little ones. So we see that um, potentially impacting language acquisition and that, that call and response that we do when we're, you know, making all of those faces and noises, even with, you know, nine-month-olds sticking a phone in between that and saying, do that cute thing again, can really interrupt that dyad of language acquisition. Um, and, and a thing called sharenting where, you know, that nine months old or even 18, two, 18 months or two-year-old can't give you permission to say, yes, I'm okay with that photo being on the internet for everyone to see. Um, and, and then it's kind of like this whole idea of like, what do we do with kids? Well, if we give them a phone in the supermarket rather than pointing things out and looking for colours or doing all of those interactive things, we're really, you know, setting up that wiring that says as soon as you're kind of a bit bored, you get this highly sensory input um, in the palm of your hand to control. So, uh, again, I run a course, Screens in Early Childhood, that helps parents and educators understand how important those kind of analogue foundations are, what to do, and how to introduce technology in a really appropriate way. So, obviously, a smartphone in the, the palm of a two-year-old is very, very different to a big screen on the, the, the wall and doing interactive things while you're watching good old play school. Mm -hmm. So you do, I was going to ask you and about your courses because you've got a, a mm -hmm. few going. Tell us uh, tell us yeah. about the programs, different programs sure. you've got because you mentioned one there. The, the one was on early learning. Yeah, screens in early childhood. Screens so, in early childhood. Yeah, because it starts that early. And yeah. for us as parents who... Um, you know, we didn't grow up with this technology, so we want to be really careful about how we introduce it, kind of like the way we introduce solids, right? You wouldn't go from a kid who is only on breast milk to say, you know, here's a steak. Mm. We really want to kind of introduce that slowly and get kids accustomed to developmentally appropriate material and, and really quality material. So, you know, we go back to things like play school in Sesame Street on a television screen as opposed to lots of kind of dings and dongs and light and sensory stuff right here. Mm. So there's obviously some, um, you know, issues, I guess, again, with the displacement of um, eyeballs looking at horizons and being in natural light and having that lux, high lux um, sort of input, especially early in the morning to help set our circadian rhythms to, you know, really looking at things in this, this short distance. So really helping parents just be more confident with knowing what to do and understanding some of the risks when, when we're talking about that early childhood before getting to school. Then I do. Hang on, hang on. I want to stop you right mm -hmm. there because to yeah. me, what is that? Is that a, a one day, an ongoing, a few days? Oh, what, tell us a bit about how long that goes on for. That course is for 45 minute sessions and it's really, um, practical. So I'll introduce some stuff really about like language acquisition in kids yep. so that we can make sure that we're not displacing that. And then we'll talk about like how all the different screens and some of the different content and then how to look for games and, um, check in with whether or not a game is really developmentally appropriate, whether it's really educational. Because anyone can make a game and plonk it in the app store and call it educational. No one's going to check, like, are you really a teacher? Do you really have any qualifications in this? It's just a label. Okay? Mm -hmm. So thinking about if apps and games came with nutritional labels, the same way that we look on the back and we have those star ratings or health heart ticks and things, yeah. what are we looking for? Yeah. So that we can be kind of a little bit more on top of all of that um, as we're introducing tech it's, because it strikes me it's a that, worry. Yeah, it strikes me that that should just be basic training for parents. I mean, that yeah. that should be rolled out to every, you know, well, paediatrician 
about to give, you know, like advising. It's coming, yeah. Oh, good, um, Jason, Jason Clare this week, as the Education Minister, just announced the Centre for Excellence for the Digital Child. Right. So that's an incredible group of um, academics, and I'm going to get all the unis wrong, but check it out. Like there is now absolutely clear funding for looking at these issues, Fantastic. as well as today it's been announced that there will be a look into social media platforms and the effect on mental health that will be um, a, kind of like a select committee that Senator Andrew Bragg is going to be the chair of. So there's lots of stuff happening in this space and right. obviously our incredible e-safety um, office and the, the commissioner, Julie Eamon Grant, their work just keeps kind of blossoming and growing and having international acclaim. We're all around the world want to replicate some of the incredible things that are happening around preventing um, cyber abuse of not just children but adults, you know, stopping child exploitation material, safety by design. So we're designing for the future of the internet so we're not making the mistakes that we have kind of, you know, let through to the keeper with where we've where we've gotten to at the okay. moment. So screens yeah. in early childhood, go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, then I do some work with schools. So schools get me in to talk to parents at all different levels. Often I'm doing side by side, shoulder to shoulder work. So getting young people to have the conversation together. So I really believe in not doing work with young people without them or for them without them. They have to be a part of that conversation so that they are the digital experts in their own lives, right? They know what's going on much more than I, I do. So um, doing work with schools, um, I have a course called um, Co-Design Your Family's Tech Use Agreement where you actually learn how to set up a tech use agreement using that digital nutrition kind of philosophy. And because every family is different, we have different values, we have different you know, interests, it's a very tailored approach. So if you come to any of my courses and you're looking for a prescription, you're looking for how many minutes and what game, you will not get that from me. It's much more nuanced and so you have to go and do the hard yards, mm. right? There's no silver bullet here. Um, and, and what yeah, is that one? That sounds so appealing. I'm co how, what is that, four 45-minute sessions as well or...? No, that's t um, that's three 45s and it's going to be available on demand Fantastic. soon. I'm going to get really into gear by Christmas yep. and I'm going to film all of these so literally you can go to my website yep. and buy them. They're self-paced courses. Yep. Um, it comes with a whole bunch of resources so you can kind of do the skeleton work yep. or you can get really savvy and, and you can start at different kind of points. So you might revisit the course several times as your kids sort of get older and you need a new agreement because it's not set and forget. Um, you know, so much of this then links into just um, habits of conversation, right? So how do you build trust with young people? How do you kind of know your kid in as they grow up when naturally they're going to push against you? Naturally, adolescence is a time where they say, okay, bye, I can't be around my parents as a pubescent human, yeah. right? So it's, it's really kind of helping parents understand some of that evolutionary biology and some of the hard wiring, given that we're now wiring in with all of this technology where, you know, issues around consent, you might have heard some of the issues happening um, in group chats with some kids in private schools around some really icky, icky, disgusting kind of comments, um, really helping parents to kind of talk to kids about tricky topics. And, again, it's not a one-off conversation. Mm. It's talk often and talk early and get comfortable with things like consent or gender questions or porn or all of those things which um I mean ultimately again it's a values thing um you know the way I talk to my five-year-old about some of these issues is probably a lot more progressive than other people are going to be comfortable with and so you really kind of have to meet people where they're at and, and tune into those values again to then see where things need to mm. go I mean you mentioned yeah. porn as one example talk about talking yeah, to huge one. talking to kids before you really think you need to be talking to them mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. reality is they're exposed to things way before they should be. Yeah, and, and we need to talk in really unambiguous terms as well. I think in the past we've sort of done this really vague kind of healthy Harold stuff where it hasn't been clearly, you know, calling uh, body parts what body parts yeah. are and talking about if this happens then you do this and and all of these sorts of things um even with something like youtube parents say to me all the time oh my kid's just watching youtube and i'm like yeah mm -hmm. but what on youtube youtube is a big chunk of porn sometimes and there's really awful people out there that want to splice 
prawn into Peppa Pig and then label it, you know, um, uh, you know, for kids. And then you have your kid doing something really, I don't know, um, naive, like Googling Barbie doing the splits. And you don't necessarily find Barbie doing the splits. Um, so we have to be really, really careful that even with naive little young minds, sometimes they come across really inappropriate material that they literally cannot unsee. Mm. You know, yeah. it just strikes me that with technology, we are all, of all ages, like kids in a, to in a sweet shop given free reign and we are just starting to learn that maybe eating all of those sweets isn't a good thing. And that actually yes. took a while to get that message through in health and, and it just needs to happen. And you are just doing such a, I mean, those courses, I feel like I've got to sign my whole family up to those courses. <laughs> before we we started, before we came on and started uh, recording, you, you mentioned your current uh, interest in the metaverse. And to, yes. just for those that aren't aware, I mean, that have been living mm -hmm. under a rock, perhaps, tell us all about the metaverse and, and some of the things, what are some of the challenges and opportunities? Sure. So the metaverse really is kind of like the next iteration of the internet. And um, it's been talked about for like 20 years, basically, but it's got, it became a bit more of a hot topic about five years ago. And then in the last 18 months, when Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, now Meta, has actually rebranded his entire company to kind of really put his stamp on the idea that he's going to be the person who creates this metaverse. We don't know who's going to create the metaverse. It's probably going to be a multiverse before it's just one single um, kind of platform. Um, and anyone who thinks that they know what it looks like is probably just being very imaginative right now. We're, we're not exactly sure. Um, what it will be is um, it's kind of linked to this idea of Web 3.0. So we're in Web 2, which is very collaborative and um all about participation and, you know, everybody having a voice. Uh, and this will be um, that next iteration where I guess it's decentralised, um, it's interoperable, uh, there's all sorts of kind of um, autonomous networks, there's cryptocurrencies and blockchain and all of these things that usually at this point when I'm talking about it, people's brains do the exploding almost emoji. Almost happening, almost happening. Yeah, because, you know, it's so new to yeah. us. Like if we think that social media is new to us, this is a whole nother level. And I guess in my work I have to challenge myself and my middle-aged brain, my perimenopausal brain, really keep up with with all of this information so really what I would encourage people to think about it um, as is an immersive space which is actually much more about a time than a place it's a time where you're immersed in an augmented or extended reality where you can kind of go into and usually it's got to do with having VR um, goggles on where you go in and you have that 3D experience so what we're expecting might happen is rather than that digital disinhibition effect, that effect of when you're kind of angrily typing to somebody on Twitter, forgetting that they're a human, you will actually potentially have more empathy with people because you're actually in the space, in that immersive environment, talking to them, not just behind a screen being a keyboard warrior. Um, there are a lot of ethical and design issues that are there, obviously. And again, you know, the eSafety Office and Safety by Design are already ahead of the curve with talking about how do we design for a responsible metaverse. I'm interested in it from the perspective of well-being in the metaverse and that extension of digital well-being um, for the next five to 10 to 50 years. So I was introduced to somebody, this is the joy of the pandemic and a really example of, of digital nutrition. I was introduced to um, a person called Kelly over in New York who's really interested in some of the same things as me. She's a brand strategist. She's just, just a really clever person. And we started chatting and I said, let's talk some more and let's talk some more. And two years later, we launched our digital baby called um, Metaversal Wellbeing, which is going to be a flexible toolkit for this next iteration of the internet. Metaversal well-being. Well, if it's anything yeah. like the other programs you're running, you're well ahead of the curve because uh, we, we need it. It's interesting you mention empathy because it is so easy to hide behind a keyboard and anonymity and say mm. all sorts of things, isn't it? Absolutely. And I see it even people who aren't even hiding behind anonymity. Um, I see people do all sorts of whack things, especially in Twitter at the moment. Um, you know, like it, it, it's 
I have this saying, you know, uh, eye contact kickstarts kindness. And when we're actually present to another human, whether it's like we are now just online or physically standing in front of one another, we have very different responses to when we're not actually present to that that person. And, you know, I've got journalist friends who get some really awful stuff said to them about, you know, them just doing their job. Mm. And I and by other adults, you know, and I just think, whoa, if we haven't worked this out as people who are supposed to have fully developed prefrontal cortex, there's no wonder kids are in group chats saying really silly things because they don't have those I call them digital orphans, right? They're not digital natives. They're digital orphans. They don't have that generation above them who are really guiding them and showing how to be helmsmen of the the digital space, how to kind of help them navigate because we've sort of not known really what waters we were, we were swimming in. Um, and, you know, there's this big move in New South Wales at the moment. Everyone's getting all head up about banning smartphones in schools. And, and I don't have an issue with putting some, some restrictions around that. It, but that's like having a pool fence and building a higher pool fence without teaching swimming lessons to me is kind of out of, out of balance. Um, especially when we're talking about fencing a pool, which is, you know, just a smartphone rather than how are we going to fence the ocean, which is the internet? Um, and you know, I'm borrowing that from Dr. Justin Coulson from Happy Families who, who talks about that, but I absolutely love it because, um, an app like Snapchat, um, which is quite popular with young people, it's actually had a bit of a resurgence, has just launched a desktop mode. Oh, wow. So if we're saying you can't use smartphones in schools, but kids are smart enough to know how to, um, get, uh, Snapchat on their desktop or on their school Chromebook or, you know, mm. hack the firewall to get that there, what are we teaching them? Where are the skills that they need to make better choices and exercise self-control if all we've done is, you know, put up these really high pool fences, forgotten that there's an ocean and not taught any swimming lessons? Yeah, and to take that analogy a bit further, if uh, if parents are meant to be lifesavers, uh, unfortunately, a lot of parents can't swim. <laughs> That's in, in, in this sea, in this sea of the internet, you know, I mean, they're just so absorbed in it themselves. They're not probably, I mean, I, and I include myself in this as well. I'm not trying to say I'm healthier than they are. But we all probably remember doing the bronze medallion, right? Like yeah. if you've grown up in, in Australia, we've had all of this like um, sa- swimming safety drummed into us. And the first lesson in that is don't get yourself into deeper waters. Then you can actually manage. You've got to go and get help rather than put yourself at risk. So we all need these lessons and we kind of need them two weeks ago. Um, there's a lot of, unfortunately, in, in my work, what happens is things have to really hit the fan for parents to say, oh, I better do something about that. It's really hard to get parents on board with proactively spending a bit of money to prevent some of these issues. Um, you know, we spend lots of money on professional development or courses for our work or to make more money, but we really don't have a headspace around needing support with, with parenting in such new kind of waters that we're trying to navigate through and, and rough waters often. Well, I think that's a really important message for us to leave our listener with. And we'll, of course, have links to your website and all Thank your you. wonderful work that you do. I love reconnecting with you. I love to, this that's is my so dose nice. of digital nutrition and, <laughs> and my therapy, yeah. but those courses are definitely ones that I'll, I'll be visiting. Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Total pleasure. Always great to chat, Ron. Now, it's exciting for me to reflect on the fact that Jocelyn joins our advisory panel on the unstresshealth.com platform, which I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at. It's a wellness program, a health program, online, accessible, in the palm of everybody's hand, built on clinical experience and backed by science. But... Don't you love Jocelyn? I mean, she's got these programs, Screens in Early Childhood, and co-design a family for the family, your tech use agreement. Now, I I have, uh, my daughters have young families, and I see the way children engage with digital devices. I mean, I have these, I have patients that bring young children in, babies, uh, maybe as young as 12 months or 18 months in a pram and will place an iPad in front of them and will keep them entertained or occupied at least for indefinitely. I mean, a bomb could go off 
and uh, the child would not even blink because it is so absorbed in, in what they are seeing. And this is about dopamine. This is about addiction. We wouldn't feed uh, a child heroin or we wouldn't feed a child nicotine because we know that is addictive. And yet digital technology is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And how are we modelling that behaviour for children. And I'm not immune to this. I'm not pretend. It's just like I wrote a book called The Life Less Stressed. Well, I have to remind people when I tell them that, that it is not autobiographical. It's aspirational for me as much as you, as much as anybody. And similarly, our use of tech. And this is why I like to get Jocelyn back on for a kind of an annual checkup uh, and assess how we're all doing for um, our tech use. And uh, I'm really pleased that she's joined our advisory panel along with some other amazing practitioners. Look, we'll have links to Jocelyn's site where those programs and so much more is available. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.